Hi everyone. Um, welcome to last um, Negrom seminar of this year and this semester. And today our speaker is uh, Jiawa Jian from University of Birmingham. And she will talk about hybrid projection methods for detecting anomalies in large scale inverse problems. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about the hybrid projection methods um, uh, for solving a large scale inverse problem. So the detecting anomalies that shows the feature of the problem is uh, the uh, anomalies are the, some sparse dots in the image. And uh, our goal is uh, we want to keep the smooth background and also detect the uh, sparse uh, the sparse anomalies. And the hyper projection method uh, is an algorithm uh, I did with my postal advisor, Julian. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge you, the collaborators related to the talk today. So first of all, um, so the hyper projection method or which we modify this method to solve some geoscience problem. So this method is uh, the motivation of this method is uh, motivated by a geoscience uh, problem to estimate the carbon dioxide emissions. So uh, Scott Miller, he's um, uh, assistant professor from John Hopkins. Uh, he's from the environmental science department. So he proposed this problem. And then uh, Julian Chong uh, from Emory University and Arvind Sababa from NC State. Uh, they are mathematicians uh, and I wear uh, together work on uh, solving this problem. And after we developed this method, I realized um, uh, some medical imaging uh, application uh, called a fluorescence molecular tomography also have uh, this kind of feature like some sparse important dots and the way this smooth background. So I worked with my collaborator at Shanghai Tech University, Wu Weizhen. He's uh, from biomedical engineering. So he does a real experiments. Um, so we uh, also use some real data to test uh, our algorithm. And also my uh, first year PhD student, Jian Wu Zhang uh, from University of Birmingham. So uh, these two people, we all work together to work on the medical imaging uh, part. So first of all, I will give a brief background introduction of the hybrid projection method. So this method is uh, focused on solving the linear inverse problem. Uh, so here the B is observed data. So A is a forward, um, uh, forward model, is a very large scale matrix. Um, and as true is a desired solution where we want to reconstruct. And the size of the A is very big. Uh, you can imagine if we want to get a very high resolution image. So for example, like 1024 times 1024, if we vectorize uh, this image, uh, so which means uh, if we want to do some image deblurring, then the A, the size of A is over a million times over a million. So which means this kind of large matrix cannot do inverse. Uh, it's not easy to do the decomposition. So the only way is a matrix vector multiplication. So the A is a super large. And here the epsilon is the additive noise. Uh, sometimes we know uh, it has some stochastic property. For example, like a Y noise, if, follow, if we know it's Y noise, then it follows the Gaussian distribution. Um, so the usual way, since A is a super yield post, uh, so the usual way for us to solve it is a way, instead of minimize the residual, we minimize the, uh, the extended residual. So there are a bunch of ways uh, to choose the regularization part. So here I just uh, give an example like the taken of regularization, which is uh, uh, very common for people to use. And also for the CT MRI uh, applications, the people use uh, total variation regularization. And also to, uh, to capture some sparsity, the people use uh, L1 regularization. It really based on the features of the X. So, and uh, this L2 norm is uh, most widely used. So um, if we know uh, the regularization, the value of the regularization parameter lambda, uh, we can write the solution of the, this uh, minimization problem here. So here, we um, now we can see the choosing a good regularization parameter lambda is very important. Here, the, if lambda equals zero, which means we totally trust 
the observation B. So which means if B is not good, like if B contains a lot of noise, uh, if B is not accurate, uh, so if we choose a lambda equal to zero, we cannot get a good reconstruction. Um, so for, uh, for another way, if a num lambda approaching to infinity, or if lambda become very big, which means we trust the regularization more, means we need to keep smoothing the, the solution. So if lambda approach to infinity, so we can see the solution of this minimization problem is just a zero. So it will give us um, like a black image if the x equal to zero. And if we put this part like a pseudo inverse related to lambda times b, and this one uh, we use it to represent the solution x lambda, which is uh, which means we choose a lambda n first, and then we can solve this problem. So um, having uh, estimate a good lambda is uh, important, but it's not easy. So I want to use this. Uh, this is a mascot of Virginia Tech. This hockey bird. This is an image developing problem. So this is a B is an observation. And if we choose lambda equal to zero, and we can use the least square to solve this problem. And then we will find that the reconstruction is like this. Because the reason is our observation is not good. It's very blurring and containing a lot of noise. And we can see the reconstruction is horribly corrupted by the noise. But if we increase the regularization lambda a little bit, we will find that we can see, at least we can see uh, what's, uh, what our object, we can see what the, this is a hockey bird. And if we keep increasing the lambda, we can find the whole image starts to smooth out. So the L2 regularization starts to smooth out the whole image. But if we keep increasing the lambda and we find it's over smooth. And if we look at the value of the lambda, we'll find that choosing a good lambda is not easy. It's very sensitive. The solution is very sensitive to the choice of the lambda. So to address this uh, problem, uh, people propose uh, this four mo uh, most widely used methods. So the, for the first two, discrepancy in principle and the UPRE, we need to know the, var uh, the variance of the noise, which is a sigma. So if we can estimate the variance of the noise, we can use, use the first two, uh, the first two methods. So here you can think about which is B minus A times this one is X lambda. So it's we try to minimize the residual. We try to find a lambda to minimize the residual. So this is our goal. So if we know some stochastic information, we can use the first two methods. If we don't know anything about the um, noise, we can use the GCV or weighted GCV. But no matter which method we'll find uh, so first of all, this um, this uh, optimization problem is nonlinear about lambda, and then the size of the optimization problem is the same as the size of the original inverse problem. So as we say, the inverse problem is a, a large scale. So which means that we need to solve this nonlinear. A large scale optimization problem. So which will be super expensive and uh, we cannot do it for the uh, real application. So to solve this, people propose this uh, Golubcon bidangalization to address this problem. So the idea is they want to use this uh, um, the Golubcon bidangalization to project the original problem on a small scale problem and then apply these techniques on the small scale problem. So, so here, um, given the forward matrix A and the observation B, so we can develop uh, the iterative scheme uh, like this. And at the iteration M, we can write the iterative, uh, iterative scheme in this matrix way. So here we can see the iterative scheme is only based on the matrix vector multiplication. And another computation is doing the transpose of the matrix A. So that's the only computational cost, uh, where this computational cost come from. So it's very cheap. And uh, uh, then if we can write this two equation to this matrix form. So here the VM and the UM, they have the orthogonal columns with each other. And the VM is actually the basis uh, of the solution. And we call it a Krylov subspace. Um, so which is a solution, uh, solution space. 
and we uh, generate this uh, curl of subspace iteratively. And uh, here the BM is a projected matrix, which is by diagonal and uh, it's M plus one by M. We can see the projected matrix only related to the number of iteration. And here the, we can see um, uh, compared with SVD, um, the, this uh, by diagonal uh, this uh, diagonalization, the advantage is we don't have to compute the singular value. So um, here we can see the um, we only need the matrix vector multiplication. We don't need the singular value decomposition. So that's why uh, in machine learning recently, uh, people like to use this method or another one is uh, Lanchos. Lanchos is a tree diagonal, so which is similar to the Golub Khan. The people like to use this method to analysis a neural network because in neural network the gradient or the Hessian matrix are also very big. So it's uh, impossible to do the singular value decomposition on this uh, large matrix. So another way is that people can do this, uh, uh, people will do this projection. Uh, the reason why people can do this projection and then do approximate uh, the singular value is because at uh, at the each iteration going on, the largest singular value of the projected matrix BM will approaching to the largest uh, larger few singular values of the uh, of the matrix A, and the smallest singular value of the BM will approach into the smallest singular value of A. So, which means at the first few iteration, the BM already captures the most important information from the A, and the BM also keeps the property of this problem because uh, this yield post. So, which means the uh, lowest, the smallest singular value will approach into zero. So, and also the smallest singular value of BM also approaching to zero. So actually the projected matrix is also yield post. So based on this equation, uh, which means we can find the solution in the square of subspace, which is VM. So, and then if we plug this one in, we get AVM times Y, and we can replace AVM with the UM plus one BM. And the UM plus one has orthonormal columns, so the UM can be can get canceled. So the left hand side is equal to right hand side. We can see the right hand side is uh, uh, only related to a very small scale projected problem, only related to the number of iteration. And usually we only need to run a few hundreds um, iterations, and then we can get a good uh, re uh, good results. So this method also converge. And then uh, based on the small scale um, uh, projected problem, we can solve the coefficient y. And uh, uh, we can apply the techniques like the uh, discrepancy principle or GCV on this small scale problem and to get appropriate um, parameter lambda. And then we can compute, uh, we can compute the y and the plug in here and we can get the x. So this is a whole flow chart of the hybrid projection method. It's given the forward matrix A and B, and we run the Golubkin by diagonalization, and we can project the large, large inverse problem onto this small scale projected problem. And uh, each time we solve the Y, we times the VM, and we can get to the um, X at the uh, M iteration. So. Uh, since uh, the lambda, we can see the lambda is automatically chosen uh, by the by, by the any like techniques we choose. So we don't have to manually tune this lambda here. So this automatically generate this automatically calculate at each iteration. So and then uh, we find uh, since we lambda is automatically estimate, we don't. Uh, so for the stopping criteria, we have another option. So we don't have to use the residual as the only stopping criteria. We can also use the change of the lambda as our stopping criteria. So usually when the lambda doesn't change that much, we can stop the, the iteration. So which this one give us another option uh, for the stopping point. So now uh, go back to the motivation uh, of uh, the project 
I will talk today. So, so the the method, we the motivation we want to develop uh, this uh, solution decomposition method. Yeah. So this is a modification based on the hybrid projection method I just introduced. So the reason we want to develop this is because in in geoscience the people have a problem. Uh, the problem is uh, they want to use uh, uh, the data from the satellite to estimate the distribution uh, of the carbon dioxide flux. So here, this is a map. This is an emission map of the carbon dioxide. So here, we, uh, look at the high peak, uh, the sparse dots here. This is the peak of the carbon dioxide. So which means this area contains the most carbon dioxide in this area. So which probably means this area has some plant power or ha have some um, animal migration or, or maybe it's a very big city and it contains a lot of people. So, so and this sparse dot are very important to the geoscience people to try to analyze uh, the carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. And also the smooth background can be the, the lighter one can be the ocean. And this one can be some uh, like the grass or the forest. Um, yeah, is a, which have a more carbon dioxide than the lighter one. So their goal is uh, they want to use, uh, this is a true solution look like. is a smooth background and have sparse anomalies, the sparse dots here. So what they do is uh, they want to do the reconstruction based on the data from a satellite, but they want the reconstruction to keep the smooth background can also show the location of the sparse anomalies. So this is uh, their goal. So this uh, reconstruction is not easy because we can see our minimization is only based on the residual. And for the, and the sparse dot has a very small area. So which means uh, this sparse dot doesn't contribute that much in the residual. So our objective function only based on the residual. Uh, so we need to change our objective function to make it have more weight on this uh, sparse anomalies. And also at the meantime, we cannot uh, corrupt the, the background. We also need to keep the smoothness and uh, the whole features of the background. So since we know our goal is uh, the true solution has uh, two features. Uh, one is a smooth background. The second one is a sparse anomalies. So we can do use a Bayesian inference uh, uh, when we solve this problem. Since we know the S1 is smooth, so we can assume it follows the Gaussian distribution. And S2 is a sparse, and we can assume it follows the Laplacian distribution. And then we can compute the uh, we can compute the uh, conditional property distribution here. So here we can see um, uh, when we compute the conditional property distribution based on S1 is a Gaussian and S2 is a Laplacian, we can get the conditional distribution uh, is uh, proportional to this exponential function. And we want to maximize this one, which means we need to minimize, uh, uh, we remove the, uh, we need to maximize this uh, power power number, and we need to minimize if we remove the negative uh, negative uh, notation here. So which means we need to minimize this function. Uh, so this is our objective function. We can see it also match our expectation because as one is smooth, so we use a Q norm. Q is a covariance matrix of the prior information. Um, we use a Q norm. Uh, to uh, to regularize the S1 and S2 is a sparse. And for the sparse feature, uh, people usually use L1. And also based on our uh, derivation, it also we get the L1 regularization on the S2. So this uh, regularization is different from the classical regularization because for classical regularization, people regularize the whole solution. So here we just uh, use different regularization on the different part. So because they have different features. And so now the goal is that we try to solve this problem. So we want um, our algorithm, the new algorithm uh, inherent the benefit of the original hyper projection method. So first of all is A and Q, they are very big. 
and kill the covariance matrix since it's a smooth. If it's a smooth, it's usually generated by the Martin kernel. And we know for the Martin kernel generated covariance matrix is a dense matrix. So, um, so these two matrix can only allow the matrix vector multiplication. So, and then the second one is the Q is a dense matrix. So we cannot do any decomposition and the inverse on the Q. And the third one is we also want this algorithm can allow us to automatically um, uh, choose the two regularization parameter because to me, one regularization parameter probably applicable in reality, but to me two uh, is much more challenging. So for the users, so we also we really need the automatically selection for this two regularization parameter. And the fourth one is we want to avoid the inner outer uh, uh, scheme or the alternating scheme. So the reason is uh, so for the natural way for people to solve this method is uh, uh, since the people already develop the hyper generalized hybrid method to solve the uh, residual plus the Q norm. And the people also um, propose this flexible hybrid method to solve this L1 regularization. So the natural way for us to solve this is we can use an alternating scheme, develop an alternating scheme to solve the two sub problem. One is uh, with a Q, another one is with the L1. They can, we can use a bi-level optimization and uh, do the inner outer um, iteration and uh, to combine these two scheme and uh, to solve it. Um, so I tried this uh, way at first, but then I find the issue is uh, if we want our final solution to have a high accuracy, we need to uh, make each sub problem, the inner or outer iteration have a very accurate, can have a very uh, accurate solution. So which means we need to, for each sub problem, we need to run a large number of iteration to get a relatively accurate uh, solution. And then uh, finally, we can get an accurate solution. So which means, uh, so this one will make the whole system very expensive because the final accuracy really depends on the accuracy of the sub problems. It doesn't contain any correction. So uh, so that's why we try to avoid the inner outer. So because it's very expensive. So our that's why our final goal is uh, we want to uh, combine this two scheme and develop a new scheme to directly solve uh, this star, this method. So before I talk about our method, uh, I will briefly introduce uh, what is uh, the generalized hybrid method. So general hybrid method is basically uh, developed to solve this uh, uh, regularization problem with the Q norm. So here the R is a covariance matrix of the noise and the Q is uh, the covariance uh, matrix uh, of the prior information of the X. So this one is uh, based on if we know some prior information of the solution and some prior information of the noise, and we can use this method. If we don't, don't know any prior information of the noise, we usually put R equal to identity. So that's also okay. So based on this method, since Q is a dense matrix and cannot take inverse, so our first step is to remove the Q inverse. So what we do is we do variable change and we plug in this variable change. We can get we can see that now we uh, remove the inverse of the Q. So and then uh, based on the original hybrid projection method, we just uh, include the information, the prior information in our Golubcon bidimensional scheme. And we call it a generalized hybrid method. So the reason is if we let Q and R uh, identity matrix, uh, then which means let's go back to the original uh, Golubcon bidimensional. So, and this one is allow us to include the prior information. So we call it a generalized hybrid method since it's more general and also included the classical uh, scheme. And uh, based on this scheme, we can also project the uh, original method on this uh, original uh, problem on this bi-diagonal matrix uh, projected problem. So, and then the second one is uh, uh, I want to introduce how people uh, modify the hybrid method to solve the L1. So um, another, uh, one classical way to, since we know L1 is non-smooth, 
So that's why it's more expensive and more difficult than solving the L2 regularization. So one natural way is people use the iterative or weighted norm uh, to approximate L1 with the L2. So there are a bunch of ways for people to choose the weighted matrix L. So here we just uh, use this one, this diagonal matrix like this defined in this way uh, to approximate the L1 regularization. So, and we can also see uh, it is approximate the L1 by L2, but also the inner term can also become nonlinear because this one we can say it's a nonlinear uh, terms here. So to avoid the non to avoid solving this nonlinear and make the whole uh, problem become nonlinear, what we do is we add an outer loop uh, to avoid the nonlinear. So we use the previous numerical solution to generate the weighted matrix and put it in the front. And then for each subproblem, uh, we can see uh, each subproblem in the loop we can see it's become the linear, linear again, and we can use the least square to solve this problem or a classical like a hybrid method to solve this problem. And another way, um, I put it in another way to for help us to understand is if we put the xk um, as the, the, the x here, so if we put the whole thing here as a y, we can see the xk is actually uh, equal to the LK inverse times Y. So for the whole thing here, if we put it as a Y, we can see for the Y when we solve it, it's actually regularized in the L2. So which means the features of the Y we get, it will be smooth. But the good thing is we add the inverse of the weighting matrix. And the weighting matrix is transfer uh, between the L1 and L2. So, and we times the LK inverse. So that this means this one will change the smooth one to the sparse one. So which means that finally we get to the solution X that will have the sparse feature since the LK is a relation between the L1 and L2. So here, this is the details of the flexible hybrid method. So we can see the V1 to VK, is they are just the original Krylov subspace, and they already generate the smooth basis in each iteration. But we put the weighted matrix inverse in the front, so which means the solution in each column, it becomes a sparse basis. And then finally, we do the linear combination on this sparse basis. That's why the final solution we get is has a sparse feature. So now uh, I want to talk about how we combine these two methods uh, to solve this uh, this objective function. So as a, first of all, also we want to remove the Q inverse. Uh, to avoid the compute uh, uh, the inverse of the dense matrix. We use a variable change on the S1, and then we can also the variable change on the S2 to avoid it. This is the main value of the S2. So then we can get the this objective function we get. And then we do the, uh, here we also do the um, variable change uh, to help us to understand. We can see if we do the uh, uh, weighting matrix, uh, in the front to the x, and if we put this one to the x tuta, we can see we can solve this problem because the L is actually a diagonal, so it's easy to have the inverse. So here they are all the L2, or and this one is the Q norm. So it's, we can use a directly solver to solve this uh, problem. Here we can see the y and the x tuta, they are all smooth. Uh, regularized smoothly. So finally, we get y and x tuta they are smoothly. And the y, it will be a smooth solution, and x tuta will be smooth, but times the inverse of the weighting matrix, so this part will become sparse. So the, the upper, upper part will be smooth, and the lower part will be sparse. And here we can see y corresponds to the S1, and S1 means smooth background. And this part corresponds to X here, and X corresponds to S2, and S2 represents the sparse anomalies. So which all the things match our expectation, like a smooth background and the sparse anomalies. So in every step, we can see this scheme keep the features of the goal, like one has a sparse feature, one has a smooth feature. And then uh, we, gen uh, we we uh, we based on that 
um, scheme, we develop this uh, iterative scheme. So this is in the matrix way. So here I want to emphasize, I will skip some details, but I will emphasize the features of the uh, of the uh, solution space. So here we can see in each column of the basis, the VK, V1 to VK, they are all the smooth spaces. They just cry of subspace. So the VK, by the way, for each VK, we times the uh, inverse of the weighted matrix, and then it becomes sparse basis in the lower part. So the WK contains uh, the sparse basis. So the smooth basis, sparse basis, and then both of them times are coefficient. We can get this is a smooth background. This is a sparse anomalies. So this one corresponds to S1 and X corresponds to the S2. So, and this is a projector problem. So which only related to the number of the iteration. So it's not expensive to solve this. So now we test our algorithm to on the first lay on a toy problem of the geo, toy problem of the geoscience. Here, the uh, we want to estimate the carbon dioxide. So the uh, the problem we want to solve is the one I just show you at the beginning. We want to reconstruct this kind of emissions. So this one is a synthetic data because we just try to. Uh, which just try to test if algorithm works. And the solution is look like in this way. We generate a smooth background and this is sparse anomalies. And this map is uh, the, is uh, North America and this part is Africa. So, and then uh, since uh, it's a toy problem, we just add a little bit of noise, like 4% noise. And we use a modern kernel to generate the cube. So here we, of course, we need to com uh, compare our method uh, solution decomposition hybrid with the other two. This one, the gene hybrid is uh, with the Q-norm. It only has smooth regularization. The flexible hybrid only has L1 regularization. So here we can see from the relative error. So we can see the we, our method has the lowest relative error. And uh, if we look at the reconstruction, we can see uh, this one is true. This one is our method. We can see our method, the background is also a little bit corrupted by the L1 maybe. So it's not as smooth as the true, but we can see we almost keep the background and also capture the anomalies it has. And for the gene hyper, if we only use the smooth regularization like the QNOM, we can see it keeps the smooth background, which is perfect but it is missing all the anomalies, all the sparse features, which is the most information, most important information for geoscientist people. And also the, for the last one is a flexible. Flexible method, we use L1. And L1, we can see for the background is a horribly corrupted the background and it's not smooth anymore. And it's very hard for the geoscientist to figure out, to distinguish if this one is a, anomalies or is this one is just a corrupted a smooth background. So it's very hard for them to distinguish this. And also, but the good thing is it has some capture some anomalies. So as I say, for our method, why I call it this decomposition is because uh, firstly, we compute the S1 and the S2. And then we plus them, sum them together, then we get this reconstruction. So which means if the geoscientist people, if they only care about the location of the sparse anomalies, they can just look at the L2. The L2 can tell them the locations of the sparse anomalies of the peak of the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions they care about. They, they can only show the location. So uh, this is a benefit of a method. So before it do the reconstruction, it do the decomposition. So um, different from the neural network method, we know we don't have to do the image segmentation. We when we we can only have the measurement, and when we do the reconstruction, we have the decomposition. And then we test our data uh, based on the more realistic scenario. So this one, the data is from NASA, the OCO2 satellite. Um, and this one, the, um, it's, a, it's a, like a dynamic problem. So the situation of the problem is uh, the satellite measure the carbon dioxide concentration, takes a measurement eight times every day. So this is a measurement. This is a carbon dioxide uh, concentration. They take the measurement every three hours. 
So every day they can get eight measurement. And then uh, the whole, they collect the data for 41 days. So 41 times eight, which is 328. So which means uh, the solution has 328, will have 328 reconstruction. And for each reconstruction, the size is 3,222. So, and finally, we compare it, we do average of the whole the S and we compare because 300 images are too much. And the noise level is around 50. Uh, since it's a, a real uh, is a real world problem, so noise is always very big for the geoscience people. And this the kernel function is also obtained from Scott, so he just told us this is a kernel function they usually use. And the foreign matrix A is generated uh, from their uh, log range transport model. Um, so this is uh, the reconstruction. So the true is not a real true. It's just uh, uh, their like a reference solution. It's uh, like what they think it should be. So this is uh, also a North America. This is uh, the, the reconstruction based on 41 days data. And this is a reconstruction of our method. We can see it's not that similar, but it's the, already the best thing we can we can get. So it has uh, some dot, and we also have some dot. And this part is, is uh, like a high, uh, high carbon dioxide emission, and this part is a high, of car high carbon dioxide emission. And for the generalized hybrid, we can see just missing all the, uh, all the important anomalies. And for the flexible, we can see it corrupts the background, so it's not very good. And another good thing is we can see, when this is the decomposition of our method. So maybe based on this uh, whole reconstruction, uh, people cannot this uh, cannot see the anomalies very accurately uh, or very clearly. But for the S two, we can see this is only contains uh, sparse information. Uh, people can see this uh, sparse dots like uh, very clearly here. And then we find um, another uh, medical image technology also has a similar feature. So this one is uh, called a fluorescence molecular tomography. So what is uh, this technology? This technology is uh, the doctor um, inject a fluorescence in the body and the fluorescence will start shining on the tumor or on the limbs or just uh, some special uh, tissues the, um, the doctor care about. And the background is just a regular tissue and the shining part is a, is a location uh, the doctor care about. So we can also see it's a very similar um, application, very similar feature as we just uh, talked about. So the fluorescence is a sparse anomalies the doctor care about. And the tissue are the smooth background. We don't want to corrupt it, but uh, uh, we still want to get it, but it doesn't have to be very accurate. But we have to get the location of the fluorescence. So this is a uh, like application in the medical imaging. So what we do at first day is my collaborator created a phantom. So the good th the advantage of the good creating a phantom is even if it is uh, like a real measurement, but uh, we can cut it and uh, get the true image because uh, we made the phantom, so we know what it look like and we know the location of the fluorescence of the special part we put. And we know the location where the fluorescence should be shining. So, which means we know the ground truth since we made it a phantom. So, and we call it, since we modify this, uh, our method and we call it a dual channel. So it's a DC, um, the fluorescence molecular tomography technology. So here we can see our method, there's a, the fluorescence is a shiny here. So, and this is a 3D reconstruction. We can see for our method, the fluorescence is shiny, and the L2 is just to smooth out everything. For the L1, and the, the just to corrupt the whole thing, the whole background. The L1, L2 means that we do the both L1 and L2 on the whole uh, whole part, and we can see it's also not very good. And so here, and especially for the S2, for the decomposition, we can see the location of the fluorescence. And the second one is uh, we do a simulation problem on a mouse. 
since our final goal is we want to do the real mouse experiment. So before that, we want to do the simulation to see how it works. So we use the final element package to simulate the, the whole uh, scenario. So this is a mouse and uh, we put, uh, we're supposed to have, a, there is a fluorescence in the, this part of the mouse. So this is our method. We can see the fluorescence is shining here. And for the this other two method, other three methods that we can see for the L1, L2, and L1. So this is a shining part here. But the background is very light. And for the L2, it's just over smooth. Either we can still probably see a little bit of shining part here, but it's not very clear. This is our method. We can see this part, the number is very high, much higher than other area, which really match uh, what the fluorescence should be. Like since this part, the fluorescence is shiny. So other parts of fluorescence doesn't shine. So this value is supposed to be very high and it shows the location of the part uh, the doctor care about. So finally, we test the uh, test our algorithm on the real mouse. So the real mouse, what we want to reconstruct, we want to reconstruct the two. We inject two kinds of fluorescence, and the limbs of the mouse uh, on the right arms. We want to show the location of the two limbs here. This is a measurement taken by my collaborator to show the rough location of this uh, where the two limbs. So this one is our method. We can see the two limbs shining here. And also another thing is um, this is a decomposition. This is a smooth background. And also for the sparse background, uh, the sparse anomalies, we can see these two fluorescences shining very clearly on the sparse, on the decomposition here. This is the L1 regularization people usually use. Uh, since it will corrupt the tissues here. So it's kind of hard to tell where the fluorescence is. Okay, so that's um, uh, the work I want to talk today. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this really nice and informative talk. I really enjoy. And um, yeah. Let's hear uh, some comments or questions from the audience. Thank you, Trang. Yeah, maybe I can I can ask one. Uh, could you just go to page seven, please? Seven. Uh, yes. Uh, you just mentioned uh, something about the stopping criteria. Yeah. And you say that you are not using the residual and it was, it was something related to lambda. Could you just explain that part one more time, please? Okay. So uh, since uh, the lambda is uh, automatic, since we projected this uh, matrix, uh, this uh, problem on this uh, iterate, uh, the projected problem. So at each iteration. So which means uh, this projected problem are very small and uh, we can use the uh, this four ways to choose uh, a good uh, lambda here at mm -hmm. each iteration. So each iteration, we need to solve the projected problem at each iteration. And this method is estimated by one of the four methods. So which means this lambda doesn't have to be chosen by the user. So it's just automatically chosen by one of these four methods. And we can use the change of the lambda to tell us uh, when the solution or the whole system become very stable, like there, there is no need for us to add a new basis in this uh, solution space. And uh, even if we add a new, the lambda doesn't change that much. So which means the solution space doesn't change that much. So here. Yeah, I see, clear, thank, thank you. you. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. All right, very nice. So, so very nice talk, uh, Jaho. Thank you. I mean, very clear, uh, very nice applications. And I mean, I, I have a few <laughs> questions, but um, the first questions I have are silly. So, I'm going to ask simple questions. <laughs> so, so what does the matrix A represent in practice? Is it the filter? Because uh, you're, you're talking about de blurring. So, I'm not exactly sure how you get the matrix A, what does it represent in practice in those applications that you've uh, 
Okay, right. so if it's a deep learning, the uh, for the deep learning, uh, we will have a point spread function. So point mm -hmm. spread function is uh, how we want to spread the mm -hmm. uh, each pixel of the image. Okay. And uh, so for the different deep learning, we have different point spread function. So we just uh -huh. use the point spread function to generate the A. A is actually corresponds to the deep blurring, the blurring operator. Like exactly. How, yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. So it's the A is the blurring operator. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Now, so one more question. So I don't, I don't see any. And I'm the organ, I'm one of the <laughs> organizers, so I don't care. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, so um, now um, this is a little bit different. So you have two components, and I think that this is critical. So two components. One is the background is smooth, and mm. then right, and exactly that's the that's the slide. And then you so the right one S two is just the, represents the anomalies. Mm, yeah. And I think and I think that's the critical part. So what do you assume about S two? So do do you do you do you have any restrictions? I'm looking at the you know S two uh, sub J has a certain you said um, it has a certain type of distribution. So what are the what are the assumptions that you make about this distribution so so this uh, this method only works on the uh, solution which have the smooth background mm -hmm. and uh, the s2 has to have the sparse feature so it's okay. supposed to have uh, some sparse dots and the value mm -hmm. of the dots is much higher than the background i see yeah. okay so it's a very specific applications right. here right well i mean this is <laughs> i actually i think it's quite general so i like that so but do you have to assume anything about the distribution of the anomalies i mean can they be clustered or do they have to have some sort of distribution uh so we actually we don't know what the distribution it should be so here oh. we just assume it's a laplacian distribution and uh, oh. uh maybe the some sparse uh, it doesn't follow the laplacian uh, maybe it doesn't work well, so which means we need to use another kind of distribution to give the prior and uh, compute the uh, conditional property distribution uh, in another way. I see. And does the algorithm tell you when this doesn't work? So it, it can, how do you determine whether it works or not? Do you have an idea? So, uh, so so far is uh, if the, it cannot capture the S two very well. So which means that we probably make a wrong assumptions on the I S2. I see, I see, okay. This makes sense, yeah. this makes sense. Very nice, very well, nice. Uh, so when you come to the US, when you visit uh, Yan Lai, maybe you stop for Virginia Tech. Yeah, sure, sure, that's true. Yeah, sure, sure. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Trang, thank you. And if there is no further questions or comments, I would like to thank you again, uh, Jiahua, for this nice talk. And um, I would like to remind all the um, audience, we will, Negrom Seminar will continue for the next semester. And we will come back on January 23rd. And I hope we will see uh, all the people. Um, and I, I want to say also Happy Christmas and Happy New Year from now on. And thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.